study today as we are traveling through the Gospel of John. John chapter 2, and we'll be picking up in verse 12. Now, last week we looked at the wedding at Cana, which was a, a time in which uh, there was this wedding going on, Jesus and his disciples, and his, his mother was there, and they're attending this wedding, and they ran out of wine. And so Jesus turned the water into wine, the, the water pots into wine, and uh, turned the situation that was uh, pretty bleak into one of enjoyment and rejoicing. Now we pick up in verse 12, and there's a connection to that story there. It says in verse 12, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. So Capernaum was kind of like, uh, for lack of a better term, was kind of like Jesus' headquarters. That was kind of like the place where uh, he would go, go to, and it was kind of the center of his ministry. It was located there in Galilee, which is a place where he ministered quite a bit uh, in his three and a half years of ministry. But they, they went from Cana down to Capernaum. And it talks about going down to, you know, in our minds, we think of a map where you're, you know, you're maybe up in East Texas and then you go down to South Texas. Back then, they didn't look at it that way. They didn't think in terms of maps, but by elevation. So when it says they went down to a particular area, it means that they went down in elevation too. And Capernaum was located in the plains right there uh, southwest of the Sea of Galilee. So they would have literally gone down to Capernaum, which is significant not only for the story, but also in relation to our own spiritual lives because there comes a point in our lives where we have to go down to Capernaum. Um, there in the heights of Cana, at the wedding feast, there's enjoyment. Christ is there. He's working. He's performing a miracle. Uh, what seemed to be bleak now became a, a, a time of enjoyment and rejoicing. And they were able to enjoy there the presence of Christ, feasting with Christ, and things along those lines. But the time came for them to go down into Capernaum as well, to go down into the place of ministry, down to the place of laboring for the Lord. And that's something that's important for us as well. Yes, we can enjoy Christ. We can have our morning fellowship with the Lord, quiet time with God. Uh, we can have our hearts filled with Christ as we turn our attention to Him in prayer and love and worship. And we can have our hearts filled with Christ and have the enjoyment that comes from being in a close relationship with Christ. But the point comes where we have to go down into Capernaum and actually work for Christ. Not just enjoy Christ, but actually labor for Christ. And that's when we go out into the workplace, into our families, into school or wherever else we go and minister Christ to other people as well. And so here they are doing this. They're going down to Capernaum and there was ministry that was going to take place there. John doesn't go into detail about that, but as we reference the other Gospels, we see that there was a lot of ministry that took place there. And so they stayed there a few days. And then in verse 13, we have the Passover mentioned. It says, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Again, uh, if you're looking at a map, you don't go from Capernaum up to Jerusalem. You go down to Jerusalem. But saying up to Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem was on uh, Mount Zion. It was on an elevated place. And so when people talked about going to Jerusalem, they talked about going up to Jerusalem because they would be going up in elevation. But here, this is the first Passover that is mentioned by John in his gospel. And the Passovers have a very important part to play in his overall gospel. This is the way that John gives us time markers within the gospel of John. Uh, three times, at least three times, the Passover is mentioned. We have it mentioned here for the first time. Uh, also, we'll find it in chapter 6 and then also in chapter 11. So this is considered the first Passover. The second Passover would be in chapter 6. And then the, the third and final Passover of Jesus' ministry would be found in uh, chapter 11 and on through the end of the book. What's interesting is, is if you do a careful reading of these different Passovers that are uh, brought to light here by John and brought to our attention, we find that there's a revelation of Christ every time you come across the Passover in the Gospel of John. Here we're going to find that at the Passover, this very first Passover, he's going to go in and cleanse the temple. Which, again, we'll go into this in more detail in a moment, which seems to indicate that of the role of a king. In chapter 6, with the mention of the Passover, 
there's the feeding of the 5,000. So he's, he's feeding them there, and there's a connection made between him and Moses. Moses gave them manna in the wilderness, and Jesus gave them, the, uh, of course, the bread. He, he, he multiplied the bread and fishes, but he also says that I'm even better than the manna that Moses gave you. I am the bread of life. Which points him back to the prophet that Jesus, uh, that Moses mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 18, where he says, a prophet like me, will, uh, God will raise up. They saw a connection between Jesus and Moses, and Jesus was a prophet like Moses, giving them bread in the desert place, uh, and they made that connection. As a matter of fact, they wanted to make him king because of it. And then the third one, the third Passover, of course, has to do with Christ giving his sacrifice. It's that last Passover where he comes, and he actually offers himself up to die on the cross, shedding his own blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Which, if you go to the book of Hebrews, ties him to the priesthood. Him being the priest offering up the blood that brings about the atonement and the forgiveness of sins. So in each one of these Passovers, there's a revelation about Jesus, an allusion to something that Jesus is. Here, king, chapter 6, prophet, and chapter 11 on as priest. So prophet, priest, and king is uh, seems to be alluded to by the apostle john through these different uh references to these various passovers now some would say chapter 5 and verse 1 is also a reference to the passover where, where we have the unnamed feast some would tie it to the passover but given that john names the passover these three other times it's unlikely that he would not name it there in chapter 5 so in all likelihood he's just mentioning three passovers again Revealing Christ as king, prophet, and priest. Then it goes on, and in verse 14, it says, And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Now, historical references would tell us that this all was going on in the court of the Gentiles. So uh, there at the temple, the Gentiles couldn't just march right up to the temple. Uh, the Jews saw the Gentiles as unclean, and so the outside court was for the Gentiles. That's where they could come, they could pray, uh, they could worship God there, but they had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. Well, it was in that court that all this uh, selling and buying and, and exchanging took place. Uh, there, as the people were coming, and this would take place about three weeks before the Passover, they, you'd have them setting up their booths and and getting ready to uh, be engaged in this merchant, merchandise exchange. And as people came into the temple, they'd enter into this court and they would buy the animals that they needed for the sacrifices. And they'd also exchange their money uh, for the approved money for the temple. So if you came with a Roman uh, denarii, if you came with Roman denarii, or you came with uh, the, the drachma or something like that, these coins had images on them, and the Jews saw that as idolatrous. And so unless you had the approved uh, Tyrian coinage when you came to the temple, your money was no good. So you had to go in and you had to exchange that money for the, the proper amount of, or the proper kind of coinage for a small profit, of course. So you had to exchange the money. They would make a profit off of exchanging this money to give you the approved money that you could use in the temple. And so what they were doing is, is they were using this court of the Gentiles as a means by which to make money and to make a profit off of the people. And, and that's what's being addressed here. They took the very place. So think about this. The Gentiles have one place and one place only in the temple where they can worship God, in the court of the Gentiles. But here the Jewish people are using that one space that the Gentiles had for their selling, for their making money, for them making a profit, which is symbolic of a deeper problem than just the fact that they are selling things there at the temple. Jesus will address that in a moment. But more deeper than that is the fact that they took God's house of prayer, he, they took the temple that was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, one that would invite people into a relationship with God, and they were using it for their own gain, their own selfish gain. Which should cause us pause and uh, cause us to reflect on our, on our own lives. Are there things that we are implementing in our lives that perhaps is squeezing other people out and coming to the Lord? 
it's not just wrong for us to have stumbling blocks in our own walk before God, right? Certainly it is. If there's anything in our lives that are keeping us and hindering us from being able to come and contact God on a day-to-day basis, we need to get rid of those things, whatever they might be. Uh, our ultimate um, fulfillment is found in drawing close to the Lord, having fellowship with the Lord, and walking in submission to Him. If there's anything that's in our way, we've got to cleanse it. We've got to get it out. But that's also true with other people as well. You go to the book of 1 Corinthians, and that's a major theme in 1 Corinthians, right? Don't do anything where somebody else might stumble. Even if it's something that's perfectly legal, perfectly lawful, you abstain from doing that because you don't want to hinder anybody from coming to the Lord or, or enjoying full relationship with God. We don't want to be in the place of pushing other people out from actually coming in and enjoying uh, the riches of God. Uh, if we find ourselves doing that, we need a cleansing. We need to uh, have this purging that Jesus exercises here. Uh, also, one thing to, oh, well, let's go to verse 15. It says, And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. All right, so this same Jesus who was turning water into wine, giving people enjoyment, uh, this pleasant miracle that he performed in Cana, now that he's in Jerusalem, he's making a scourge of cords, and he's driving people out, and he's basically purging that court of the Gentiles of all these people who were selling merchandise. They didn't have to do it there in that court. They could have done it outside the temple. They could have found another place to offer these services to people. And he's driving them out to open up a way for the Gentiles to come and worship God. And so we find the compassionate Jesus, now the angry Jesus, as we continue on in this chapter. And this is a picture that a lot of people don't have of Jesus. They see Jesus as, of course, this meek, um, never heard a fly type of person. And he certainly was meek and gentle and lowly in heart. He himself said that about himself. But boy, you started messing with the things of God or you started uh, taking advantage of other people. His anger was aroused and he would act on that anger and display that anger, which shows us that anger in and of itself is not a sin, right? I think sometimes we might feel guilty for being angry. Uh, In the book of Ephesians, it says, be angry, yet do not sin. So anger itself is not a sin, but it can be a sin if it comes from the wrong source, okay? So if we're ever becoming angry, that in and of itself is not wrong, but what we need to consider is, is why am I becoming angry? Jesus was not becoming angry here because of some selfish uh, chip on his shoulder, because um, he felt threatened by these people, or because uh, somehow they made him mad. This was not a selfish reason. We'll find out later, it's, uh, Psalm 69 is going to be quoted. It's his devotion for God's house. It's his zeal for God's house that caused him to be consumed with this anger. Other places, Jesus would become very indignant when, when he saw that other people were uh, ostracizing others, when other people were uh, oppressing others. That would excite the anger of, of Jesus. His anger was always towards or on the behalf of another person, whether it was God or his fellow man. Oftentimes, our anger is self, selfishly motivated. Well, that, that person should have treated me better, or I feel like this is the way this particular event should have taken place, and this didn't fit how I envisioned things to take place. And our anger oftentimes is selfishly motivated. But there, are, there is a thing such as uh, righteous indignation. There is a time in which we should be angry. We should be angry when we see injustices. We should be angry when we see God being defamed. We should be angry when we see other people being misused and abused. That should excite anger, and not just an anger that just burns us on the inside, but actually moves us to action. That's what happened to Jesus. When he saw this taking place, he took up that, that uh, scourge of cords, and he drove everybody out. And by the way, before we picture in our minds Jesus, uh, you know, welting people with a whip and uh, you know, abusing them. And this, this scourge of cords is just ropes. It's the same word that's used to talk about the ropes on a boat. Uh, this was not the same thing that he was scourged with that had the little pieces of bone that would actually tear someone's skin or anything like that. Uh, 
And there's nothing in here that actually says he actually hit somebody. He just used it to drive everybody out. Maybe he just used it on the animals. And driving the animals out, the people would go out too. So we don't want to make this into too much of a violent occasion. But he did do what was necessary to make sure that God's house was honored. And he, and he definitely was moved by what was going on. And he acted upon it. Which is something that we can, we can definitely learn from. He says in verse uh, 16, and, the, and to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. And now this might be an, a messianic allusion. We're going to see several messianic allusions, in other words, uh, instances in which Jesus is basically doing something or saying something that would cause people to think about the Messiah in the messianic age. And here he talks about or we see him actually purging out these merchants out of the Lord's house. And if you go to Zechariah chapter 14, in the very last verse of Zechariah, in chapter 14 and verse 21, there's a messianic text here that points to the Messiah that talks about this very thing taking place, or could be talking about this very thing taking place. And it's the very last sentence within that verse where it says, And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. And you say, wait, Canaanite, that's not what we're talking about here. Well, that word for Canaanite can also be translated merchant. Okay, so uh, it could be translated either way. That's why I say this may be an allusion to the Messiah. It might not be. But if we take that word Canaanite as being uh, translated as merchant, it certainly fits with what's happening here in John chapter 2. There will no longer be a merchant in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. Why? Because Jesus drove them all out. And so, again, this could be a... Jesus acting out not only out of anger and zeal for God's house, but also showing them and revealing to them his messianic role of cleansing this temple and uh, driving out these merchants. Also, what's being alluded to here, and we talked about this uh, at the beginning, is this allusion to the kingship of Christ. In him purging out the temple, this is very much in line with what the kings in the Old Testament would do. We could think about Hezekiah. Remember when Hezekiah came and he brought his reforms? One of the main things that he did was he went into the temple and they took out all the uh, idolatrous vessels and, and images and things that were in the temple and they took them and threw them out into the Kidron Valley uh, and, and destroyed them and completely cleansed the temple. Josiah did the same thing as well. Uh, not only did he repair the temple, but he also was instrumental in cleansing the temple as well. And so when Jesus is going in here and he's cleansing the temple and purging out these merchants in the temple, he's exercising some authority. He's showing some authority. He's assuming some authority that he has the right to go in and actually purge out the temple. And this wasn't lost on the audience. They are going to pick up on that, as we'll see in a moment. But here, Jesus is not only showing himself in a messianic role, but also in a king role, kingly role, as he's purging out the uh, these things in the temple. And then he says in verse 17, he says his, mis I'm sorry, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Again, an allusion to Psalm 69, actually a quote from Psalm 69 and verse 9. And the Jews back then always saw David, the things in connection to David, his life, as a picture, as an illustration of the coming Messiah, because the Messiah was going to come as the son of David. And so there in Psalm 69, it's actually David speaking, but it was believed that this was also a messianic prophecy as well. That yes, David had a zeal for the Lord's house, and that had consumed him, but also this coming Messiah would also have the same zeal as well. And so this quote of uh, Psalm 69, once again, another messianic allusion to Christ. And then in verse 18, it says, The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? So here they are definitely making a connection between this driving out of the merchants and Jesus assuming some type of authority. And they're wondering, who is this guy? Who, who is it that would be so bold as to assume this authority to go out and drive out the money changers. Um, this is a carpenter or a common worker from Nazareth. What does he have, assuming that he can come in and exercise this type of authority? That's what they're questioning. In verse 19, Jesus answered them, 
to destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then the Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. All right, so here he talks about the destroying of the temple and then raising it up again. Again, which might be a reference, a messianic allusion to uh, his role. In Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, it says, Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, uh, for he will be, or he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. All right, so way back, uh, the Jewish people always saw this as a messianic uh, text. The, Kar the Targum, the Talmud, the, the Mishnah, uh, all these old Jewish documents allude to the fact that even early on, even before Jesus, the Jewish people saw this text as a messianic text, okay? And what it basically says is that this Messiah, this branch, was going to come and he was going to build the temple. He was going to rebuild the temple. And not only that, but he was going to sit on the throne and bring together the two offices of priest and king, which was taboo back then. You, you didn't mix the priesthood and the, the king, kingship. Uh, these were two separate roles. You were either king or you're a priest. You were not both. And if you tried to cross over, then you were, you were as Uzziah did, if you remember that, when he came in and assumed the role of priest, um, God struck him with leprosy. So that was a serious thing. But the Messiah would come and bring these two roles together. But in connection to that, he was going to rebuild the temple. And so as Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. He's showing the full fulfillment of that text. Because with it being a messianic text referring to the Messiah, it's not talking about a physical temple there as far as this Messiah is going to come and he's going to build these stones up in Jerusalem and it was going to be a physical temple. It was an allusion to the spiritual house that he would establish, uh, which is tied to his ministry. But more directly, Jesus is speaking about his own body and his own resurrection, uh, as uh, John helps us out to understand here. It says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body in verse 21. But notice in verse 20, it says, the Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Maybe they would have been comfortable with uh, someone claiming to be the Messiah saying that he can rebuild the temple. But to say he can rebuild it in three days, uh, that was an impossibility. They said 46 years it took in building this temple. Which isn't really talking about when it was originally built. This is the second temple. This isn't the original temple built by Solomon that was destroyed uh, by Babylon back in the 6th century BC. This was the second temple. That was built when Zerubbabel and the exiles come back and they rebuild the temple. Well, it was built then, but then when Herod came along, Herod the Great, back in uh, B.C. 20, thereabouts, he started to build onto the temple and to kind of uh, make it more elaborate. He was really big into architecture and things, so he was constructing and building on, adding to the temple. And by this point, it had been 46 years since that started taking place. The actual completion of all of that wouldn't take place until uh, 64 AD. Um, so what this shows us, this is a time indicator for us, for those who are serious Bible students and you want to get your dates right on your timeline and all, that, and all that. What this shows us is that this event actually took place in 27 AD. You say, wait a minute, if Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry, wouldn't it be 30 AD instead of 27 AD? And this is a little bit too early for that. Well, that gets us into a whole other thing. But uh, basically what happened is, is there was this guy by the name of uh, Dionys... Uh, if I can say it. Um, oh, uh, oh, what is his name? Uh, Dionysus. Dionysus. Uh, in the 6th century. Uh, he was a person who... He wanted to come up with a uh, table for... The Easter's to, to basically say when all the Easter's were taking place throughout the years. And what he did was he came up with this idea of, of tying the, the counting of years all the way back to the incarnation of Christ. 
Before that, they would go back to Domitian, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to go all the way back to the incarnation of Christ, uh, him being a Christian and all. And so he did that. And that didn't really take root until about the 8th century uh, AD. But um, when he did that, he wasn't focused on historical references and things like that. He was just counting back the Easter's. And it seems to be that he was off by a few years. So actually, Jesus probably would have been born more around uh, 4 or 3 BC, which would take you 30 years in the future to 27 AD, where these events take place. And let me bring that up because you might get confused. Some scholars still hold firm to, yeah, Jesus was born in 1 AD, he began his ministry in 30 AD, and then he was crucified in 33 AD. Uh, you'll see that in some commentaries and things, but sometimes you'll see that brought back a little bit. Um, just something to think about as you're considering the timeline of everything that's taken place. But this seems to nail it to 27 AD. This also fits other references that Luke makes in Acts towards the different people who were pro councils and, and rulers at that time. And it'll help you understand that, the book of Acts, a little bit better too, if you know that it's a little offset. But, anyways, it says, uh, for 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. This is impossible. Uh, this major construction, this elaborately built temple, the one that when you were walking up to Jerusalem, you would see it glistening in the, in the light because it was so beautiful and so elaborate. You're going to build it in three days? They said, and he said, and, G, and John says, no, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about the temple of his body. If you remember, as we were going through the gospels, this is the one thing that they brought up, one of the things that they brought up against Jesus. He said he's going to come and destroy the temple, right? And they, they made accusation against him. False witnesses came up. He's going to destroy the temple. He's speaking out against the temple. But he didn't say he was going to destroy the temple. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And not only that, he wasn't even talking about the physical structure where he was standing. He was talking about the temple of his body. Now, why was it that Jesus thought of his body as a temple? This seems to be the first time this has ever happened. I can't think of any person in the Old Testament that ever spoke of their body as a temple. Um, we definitely see it come to light in the New Testament, as we'll talk about in a moment. But Jesus thought of his own physical body as a temple. Well, you have to think in terms of the Jewish people and how they thought about the temple. What was the temple? It was the very dwelling place of God in their eyes. It was a place in which God dwelt among his people. And as we saw in chapter 1 and verse 14, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we, we said, you know, that, that word dwelt can literally be translated tabernacled among us. Uh, the word tabernacled among us and dwelt among us, he was among us in that way. Much like God was in the tabernacle in the wilderness, his presence being with his people, also how he dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem and was in the midst of his people during Solomon's day. But now Jesus Christ is the true temple. He is the one who is God manifested in the flesh. He is the one who had God dwelling in him. And he was the one who manifested God to the people. And therefore, he could rightly say, my body is the temple. And he could view his body as the temple of God. And so here when Jesus says, destroy this temple, in other words, destroy this body, I'll raise it up in three days, and that's exactly what he did. In resurrection, he brought his body up from the grave and uh, was able to live again. Now as you think about it in, in terms of the church, aren't we also called his body? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 27, Paul says very bluntly, he says, you are the Lord's body. Very plainly says, the church is Christ's body. And we are his body in the sense that we are the physical representation of Christ on the earth. Christ ascended into heaven, and therefore no one can physically see Jesus anymore. You don't go to Jerusalem or Nazareth and say, hey, I'm going to go see Jesus. He's now ascended into heaven, and he's poured out his Holy Spirit into the church. And as his spirit, Holy Spirit indwells each believer, we then collectively become the body of Christ. And so we too are the body of Christ. He had a physical body there for those 33 and a half years as he lived here on earth. But he ascended and then he now dwells in millions of bodies and is manifested in this, these millions of bodies who make up the church has now become his manifested body on the earth. 
which means also that this body then is the temple as well. We should think of us not only as the body of Christ, but also the temple of the living God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there in verse 17, Paul speaking to the church, and it's in the context of the church collectively, he says, do you not know that you are the temple of the living God? And so we are Christ's body, but we are also the temple as well. Why are we the temple? Because we have God dwelling in us and dwelling within us. In the same way that Christ was the temple, in a sense, we too are the temple, the, manifest, the manifestation of God's presence on the earth. But that's true not only collectively, but also individually as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul there, in, in speaking about uh, sexual purity and things like that, um, he says in verse 29, I'm sorry, verse 19, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And so each and every one of us individually can think of our bodies as a temple. The same way that Jesus thought of his own body as a temple. Why do we think of our bodies as a temple? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so that is no small thing, to have the living God, the creator of all things, the, the greatest being in the universe, dwelling in each and every one of us. So what can we say in relation to that? It means we cannot be destroyed. We cannot be torn down permanently. We can say the same thing that Christ said. Destroy this temple, and in three days, Christ will raise it up again course metaphorically speaking in other words there's nothing anyone can bring against the church there's nothing that anyone can do against us collectively or individually that will tear us down permanently because we will be raised again jesus said upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades shall not prevail against it hades uh, basically meaning the place of the dead death will not prevail against his church why because of the resurrection People may ridicule, ridicule us, they might slander us, they might put us down, they might see what we believe is silly, or they might even go so far as to physically persecute us and, and kill us. But in the end, we have the victory through Jesus Christ. Try to destroy his body, try to destroy the temple, and it will just be risen up again. We see that historically, time and time again, the church is persecuted, but it somehow finds a way to rise up again persecuted again, rises up again. But we'll see it ultimately, of course, in the resurrection, when physically we are all raised from the dead and we join Christ in his resurrection. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story because there's going to come a time when Jesus Christ himself will become the temple once again. In Revelation chapter 21, in verse 22, in the... In, uh, the context of the new heavens and the new earth. It says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. There's going to come a time where there's no need for a temple anymore, because God himself will be the temple. Then it will be the full manifestation of what the temple was pointing to. The time in which God will tabernacle over his people, we will abide in him forever, and he will become the temple eternally. And so this points towards a future hope for us as well. But there's application to this too, as we think about our own bodies as the temple of God and having the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Well, because that's a great call to holiness, too. It not only helps us in our hope and expectation, the fact that we won't um, ever be completely destroyed, that God has the final say, but today, presently, it means that we should be living a very holy life. If God is dwelling in me, and if God is dwelling in each and every one of you, that's a high calling for us. That we are God's manifestation on the earth. That we are the ones through God is working. We are the ones through whom God is laboring and showing himself to the world around us. We should not bring God into sin. We should not bring God into, um, into vanity, emptiness, worldliness, 
selfishness, things like that. We want to bring God and, and open up to God a place of holiness and righteousness and purity so that he can come and dwell and manifest in us in a very powerful way. And so Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. But he was speaking about his body and we can think of our bodies in a similar way as well. And then verse 22 says, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Uh, the scripture there may be a reference to uh, the Psalm 69 that was quoted earlier, uh, but nonetheless, when they saw Jesus raised from the dead, they said, yeah, he did rebuild the temple in three days. They saw the connection between these two things. All right, there we'll, we'll leave off in our study today. The reason why we're going to do that, even though we only have, uh, what, three more verses left in the chapter, is because these last three uh, verses in this chapter seem to be connected to chapter 3. Okay, so it talks about God knew uh, what was in the heart of man, things like that. And then in chapter 3 it says, and there was a man, Nicodemus. So there seems to be a connection between these. So we're going to put the uh, verses 23 through 25 in the context of chapter 3, or will in next week. So as we think about these things, we... We should have our faith boistered into understanding that Jesus truly was the Messiah. He truly was the fulfillment of these various passages that we looked at. And that he was actually the, the temple of God here among the earth. Or here among people here on the earth. And that we can be connected to him in that way as the story is not over. He is now dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit. And he can still be manifested in the world through uh, that process. So as we, as we reflect on that, I'd just like to open the invitation to anyone who would like to become a part of this temple. This is not an exclusive thing where only a few people uh, are the temple. Uh, this is a way that's opened up for everybody. Anyone who would place their faith in Jesus Christ can become a part of his temple and have his Holy, Holy Spirit dwelling within them. No matter who they are, no matter where they come from, all of us can be built up as a temple unto God. And I'd invite you to become a part of that temple as you place your faith in Jesus Christ, as you repent of your sins, as you confess him as Lord, as you are baptized into him, as Galatians chapter 3 talks about, and as you're raised to walk in newness of life and being filled with the Holy Spirit and living a life that glorifies him. If you'd like to participate in that, please come forward as we stand and sing the song that JT 